Good evening, everyone. So today I'll be discussing evidence-based management of bronchiolitis based upon the RCH guidelines updated 2020, the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines of 2014, and the standard treatment guidelines of IAP 2022. So coming to the topic, that is bronchiolitis and evidence-based management. So as we all know, the etiology of bronchiolitis is mainly most common. It is respiratory sensation virus or RSV, but you can also have bronchiolitis due to rhino, coronavirus, BOCA, adeno, and metanumo virus. So it's basically a lower respiratory tract infection where the smaller bronchioles are involved, the smaller airways are involved. So it is definitely an airway disease, just like we say asthma, but here the site of involvement is the bronchioles. And the pathology exactly is epithelial cell inflammation leading on to mucosal edema. There is also increased mucus secretion as well as ciliary dysfunction and cell death. Blocking of the lumen by cell debris also happens. So as you can realize now, the mainly it is edema, increased secretion as well as ciliary dyskinesia, cell death and shedding of the epithelium causing obstruction of the lumen. There is some amount of bronchospasm, but that is minimal. The other pathology is the one which mainly causes the symptoms of bronchiolitis. And we also need to know what are the risk factors for severe disease. When bronchiolitis happens in a baby less than 12 weeks, someone with a history of prematurity, underlying cardiopulmonary disease or immunodeficiency, the chance of bronchiolitis being severe is more. Now, what are the clinical features? Or so when do you suspect bronchiolitis? Anytime you have a baby who presents to you with the first episode of wheeze in less and who is less than two years of age, we usually think of bronchiolitis. So normally this would initially appear as just any viral infection, a low-grade fever, an upper respiratory infection, leading on to feeding difficulty, which may be because of a nasal block initially, but later they may have fast breathing, and if the disease progresses further, there may be intercostal and subcostal retractions, and in very severe cases, the babies do have grunting, severe retraction, cyanosis, and even apnea. So this is the spectrum, clinical spectrum of bronchiolitis, that is, it can vary from mild to very severe, and uh, on auscultation, usually you're going to get wheezes and crepitations. Now, and when you uh, commonly, when you have a severe bronchiolitis, you would often have a baby with retractions, as you can see here, subcostal and intercostal retractions. And if it is very severe, you can have retractions that which are quite severe with even grunt, because usually we associate grunt with a parenchymal disease, and we don't associate grunt with asthma classically. But in case of bronchiolitis, if it is severe, you also can have grunt. What is the differential diagnosis? In fact, anything that can cause a wheeze becomes a differential diagnosis. So the commonest one is naturally your thought of a first episode wheeze or a first episode uh, wheeze in a patient who subsequently going to develop asthma. Similarly, pneumonia with wheeze and some other aspiration syndromes like foreign body aspiration, GE reflex, tracheoesophageal fistula, all can present to you with wheeze and will be a differential diagnosis for bronchiolitis. But in these cases, Apart from pneumonia and asthma, all other conditions, usually there is no fever prodrome. It may be related to the feed or it may be related to some choking episode or it may be some posture changes. They get that wheeze which comes. Cystic fibrosis, congestive heart failure, vascular ring, mediastinal mass and allergic reaction or anaphylaxis may be some other differential diagnosis. But clinically, usually whenever you have a viral prodrome and progressive worsening of respiratory distress when they present to you classically it usually unless otherwise proved it is a bronchiolitis when auscultation reveals crepitations and ronking. Now what are the investigations? Normally for bronchiolitis investigations are not needed and sometimes we do send nasopharyngeal swab to detect which virus is circulating and what is causing the bronchiolitis. And especially if for example a virus like RSV which can be quite infective you can think of cohorting also so that they don't spread the disease to other babies admitted in the ward. So that is one reason where you would like to go for an NP swab. Remember, 
when you send a nasopharyngeal swab and you get a virus like rhinovirus, it does not necessarily mean that at that particular time, the baby is having a bronchiolitis due to a rhinovirus. It may be a virus which is persisting from the previous infection. On the other hand, when you get a nasopharyngeal swab RSV, it usually indicates that it is the causative organism for bronchiolitis. Blood routine is also not routinely sent. If sent, it will usually show a viral picture, but chest x-ray has uh, usually chest x-ray will show uh, hyperinflation. That is because, as we already said, this is a bronchiolitis, an airway disease where the airway is narrow because of mucosal edema. And inspiration being an active process, you will have air coming in, but expiration being passive, the air usually gets trapped inside the alveoli. And that is why you get a hyperinflation, which may be described as set six or seven anterior ribs in the midclavicular line. Or you can also have the floating heart sign where the inferior border of the heart is visible because of the hyperinflation. But in some cases, the mucus secretion uh, in the small bronchioles may completely obstruct the lumen of the airway, leading on to collapse of the airway, collapse of the alveoli, and that may also be seen in X-ray. So in an X-ray, you mainly see hyperinflation, but you can also see patriotelectasis also. Now, coming to the management, being a viral infection, it is definitely supportive management. If the baby has fever, it no, needs to be managed with paracetamol. Keep the baby well hydrated so that the mucous membrane is not drying up. So hydration is very, very important. And also nasal block can be treated with saline nasal drops. And sometimes if the nasal block is causing a lot of problem and babies finding difficult to feed, you can also do a gentle nasal suction with nasal suction bulb can also be advised. Now coming to the medical management of bronchiolitis. The four drugs which are often discussed is hypertonic saline, nebulized adrenaline, nebulized salbutamol or beta-2 agonist and corticosteroids. Now let us see one by one where these four drugs really stand when it comes to the evidence. In fact, corticosteroids do not significantly reduce outpatient admissions, do not reduce the length of stay in patients who are already admitted with severe bronchiolitis. That means in bronchiolitis, steroids is not useful in mild cases as well as in severe cases. So it is not recommended. The Cochrane 2013 review also comes with the same recommendation that corticosteroids are not recommended in children with bronchiolitis. Now, what about beta-2 agonist? When you give beta-2 agonist, some babies may show a transient improvement but most infants treated with bronchodilators will not benefit from their use because the main reason for the wheezing that happens in a bronchiolitis is not exactly a bronchospasm, but because of the mucosal edema as well as obstruction of the lumen with cell debris, both of which will not be benefited by a pure beta-2 agonist nebulization. That is why bronchodilators are not recommended in case of bronchiolitis. But in practice, when you have a bigger child, when you have a relatively bigger child, especially with a strong family history or a personal history of eczema, you may give a trial of salbutamol and see if it is responding or not. But again, you repeat, the guidelines do not recommend salbutamol nebulization, even in those with a family history of asthma. But in practice, we always, when you have a positive history, we may give a trial to say that see that we are not dealing with an RAD exacerbation. Now, basically, we also need to understand that if you're talking about a bronchiolitis in a very young baby, say less than six months of age, that is a time where they don't have much of well-developed bronchial muscles. And here we are talking about the bronchioles. So even the muscle would be even lesser at those patients. So that is also the reason why they do not show response to salbutamol. And that is why it is not recommended in bronchiolitis. Now coming to hypertonic saline. So just now we said that the cause of wheeze is not bronchospasm, but mucosal edema and obstruction of the lumen with cell debris. That brings the question, then will hypertonic saline be helpful? Because hypertonic saline has been found to increase mucociliary clearance in both normal and diseased lungs. And rehydration of the airway surface liquid happens when you're giving nebulization with hypertonic saline which is found to reduce inflammation and mucus plugging. But what they have seen is that it bron uh, hypertonic saline nebulization for children with mild bronchiolitis who come to you 
in the OPD, they are not really benefited by hypertonic saline, and that's why it's not recommended as an OP nebulization. But for children with moderate or severe bronchiolitis who are admitted in the hospital, they do show response to hypertonic saline, but it does not decrease the length of stay, where the expected stay is less than three days. So again, what does it mean? When you have a mild to moderate bronchiolitis, which itself is uh, getting cured rapidly, their hypertonic saline has no role. But when you have a bronchiolitis, which is quite severe, which is causing a prolonged uh, hospital admission, that subgroup of patients definitely is showing response to hypertonic saline. So here, if you have a severe attack, you can think of using hypertonic saline. But remember one more thing. If you are really dealing with an asthma, hypertonic saline is not recommended because uh, hypertonic saline may act as an irritant and cause a bronchospasm. But in bronchiolitis, it may be beneficial. Now, what about adrenaline? Remember, adrenaline acts on both alpha, beta, and beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. Here, we are mainly looking at the effect of alpha effect of adrenaline because alpha effect, it will cause uh, vasoconstriction and that way it can decrease the edema. But remember, adrenaline effect is short living. It will last for only 60 to 90 minutes. So uh, on the day of admission, that is when a child comes to you in the ER, you give him an adrenaline nebulization. He will show or he may show response to the nebulization and you may avert an admission on that particular day. But in fact, it does not do anything to the course of illness. So the baby will again come back to you the next day with persistent respiratory decay. Uh, distress. So that is why it has been found that adrenaline does not decrease the length of stay, but definitely it does have a role as a rescue therapy. So that is what the bottom line is, not recommended in the emergency room, not routinely recommended for admitted patients also, but may be used as a rescue therapy in very severe cases. Remember, the duration of action is only 60 to 90 minutes. Now coming to oxygen. So when do you give oxygen? What is the recommendation? The recommendation is children with SpO2 more than 90% do not routinely require supplemental oxygen. This recommendation is both from the American Academy of Pediatrics as well as the RCH guideline, the Royal Children's Hospital guideline. Both say that if baby is otherwise okay and saturation more than 90%, they don't require supplementation. And uh, no need to monitor oxygen saturation continuously with pulse oximeter. So that is also important. So every time, say, a, a child with a borderline saturation, 85, 88, you have started an oxygen prongs, two liters per minute, and the oxygen saturation has gone up to 95. Then you just do, don't need to put the child continuously on a uh, pulse oximeter monitoring. Why do they say so? That is because we all know that when the baby moves, there is always an error in measurement can happen. And alarms will affect an infant's sleep. And alarm fatigue of the health person also happens. Because if always you are getting in between alarms, then nobody bothers about the alarm. So even the baby deteriorates, you will not know. You have over-reliance on the measurement. because And that leads on to less monitoring of the baby. So that is the reason why they say that when a baby with bronchiolitis is administered, and when the patient is hypoxic, give them oxygen, and then go for a clinical monitoring. That is most important. How is the baby doing? Is the baby feeding? Has the respiratory distress come down? Has the grunting subsided? Has the respiratory rate decreased? So more than the value in the pulse oximeter, it is the value of the clinical assessment that is more important. And always remember when you're keeping ox, always start with oxygen by prongs. For an infant, you can give maximum of two liter per minute. And for a child, maximum of four liter per minute, because this is the maximum air that can be humidified by the paranasal sinuses. That is why this upper limit for adults, you can even go up to six liters per minute. Now, for those who do not respond to a uh, simple nasal prong, definitely high flow nasal cannula, that is heated, humidified, high flow nasal cannula may be used. It has been found to decrease the work of breathing and also decrease the need for intubation. So because it is humidified, that also helps to so hydrate locally, provide oxygen in a more comfortable manner and help in more better mucociliary clearance. So this is one of the indications for using HFNC. The complication, uh, you can have a pneumothorax, but remember it is very, very rare. And one other thing that you can use is definitely if the patient is not responding on HFNC, 
the next you can go is go for a CPAP. And in fact, in India, you can use an indigenous CPAP also where the um, prongs is connected to a T connector and the one end of the T connector is connected to the oxygen flow meter and the third end is connected to an underwater scene. So this simple indigenous method of providing CPAP in a case of severe bronchiolitis, you will find that the respiratory distress comes down. And if you have a bubble CPAP, even that can be used. And when only all these things fail, would a baby require an intubation? So normally that is not required. Most babies, even when admitted, a simple oxygen prong or HFNC would do. A very miniature, very minuscule amount of them would be requiring an NIV or an intubation. And for any reason, once you find that the baby is better and you're discontinuing oxygen, then we have to observe the baby for two hours to see that reappearance of distress is not happening before you decide to shift the child to the ward or or allow the baby to go home. And if the baby is taking less than 50% of the feed, do not hesitate to put a nasogastric feed and provide them with two-third maintenance of fluid. Because IV fluids are not recommended. It's always better to go for a nasogastric feed. But the total quantity should be two-third requirement because there is always a risk of having a CR in a baby with severe bronchiolitis. There is no role for antibiotics, antivirals, as well as physiotherapy. So that was for today. Thank you.